live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's theCUBE, covering Red Hat Summit 2019. Brought to you by Red Hat. Well, good afternoon, wherever you might be watching us here on theCUBE. We are live in Boston as we wrap up our coverage, uh, headed toward the, uh, the home stretch, you might say, of Red Hat Summit 2019. Along with Stu Miniman, I'm John Walls, and thank you for joining us here. We're now joined by Alois uh, Reitbauer, who is the Vice President and uh, Chief Technical Strategist and Head of Innovation Lab at Dynatrace. And Alois, good to see you today. Thanks for being with us. Hello, thanks for having me. Uh, so software intelligence, that, that's your, uh, your, your primary focus. You've got headquarters here yes. in the Boston area, back in Austria. Tell a little bit about it, you would, Dynatrace, and uh, I guess, um, first off, what this news this week has meant to you in terms of uh, the releases, and then maybe what you're doing in general. You know, what Dynatrace is all about. Yeah, so Dynatrace has been around for like quite a time. Um, started out as an APM company like 14 years ago. Have been reinventing ourselves over and over again. And um, so we moved from the traditional monitoring approach. So the innovation we had in the very beginning when we launched the, the first product was really what we back then called PurePass, so the ability to trace end to end. Now we hear a lot about tracing, tracing like becoming mm -hmm. super cool for microservices. So uh, it would be like the first T-shirt we could be wearing, doing tracing before it was cool, like 14, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, mm. And then obviously we're evolving the product more and more, scaling it to bigger and bigger environments. Um, so what does bigger and bigger mean? I remember in the beginning uh, when we were working on environments, we were talking about like 100 hosts, that's a big environment. And we're like, okay, 500 hosts, like that's a big environment. Today we say for even 100,000 hosts, okay, it's a big environment, but it can <laughs> get even bigger. Then the massive change was really for us five years ago where we re-implemented our entire um, product offering, built the new Dynatrace um, with the focus that we realized that, okay, it's data and showing people data and having them analyze data is nice, uh, but it's only getting you so far. So the more complex your replication you get, the more data you get to analyze. And mm -hmm. it's just more or less exponentially scaling how many people you would need to deal with this. And that's why five years ago we started to um, incorporate AI into um, our new core platform then for automatic problem analysis. That's also why we said we're not just APM, that's just what we call like the DOG tools, data on glass tools. They show you a lot of data, do some analysis on top of it, but they don't help you to uh, really resolve a problem. So we used, built an AI engine that automatic root cause analysis. Again, the next t-shirt, mm -hmm. doing AI ops before it was cool, <laughs> like five years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the latest evolution, uh, we also saw, again, another change in the way people are using monitoring tools. Mm -hmm. um, we've invested a lot into building out an API, so we don't see monitoring tools, like being the monitoring tool here and the application over there, but having the monitoring tool being tightly integrated into the fabric via APIs. So we have, as of today, 80% of our customers are using the product also via APIs by tying them into operational automation what we heard even today in the keynote here about AI ops and how AI ops starts to control and manage a platform, more or less becoming the intelligence or the backplane behind a, a modern cloud native stack. Yeah, so we had Chris Wright on, uh, for, who was in the keynote this morning, came on our program uh, this morning too, and we talked about just the, the rippling effects of distributed architectures. If I look at my applications, they're you know, going to microservices architectures, you look at Where's customers' data? Well, lots of stuff all over the clouds and SaaS, and that has a ripple effect to, to your space. You know, I hear observability, monitoring, uh, you know, heck, even bring up like you know, the serverless world, uh, it becomes a whole separate meeting. So um, Dynatrace has been going through a transformation. You know, give, give us a point check as to you know, where your customers are, how you're helping them move through the, this modernization and you know, move to distributed architectures and uh, where, where that fits in. So the, the customers we focus on mostly are like Fortune 500 customers who we work with, and obviously they have everything that exists on the planet when, when we talk about software, like even from the mainframe to cloud native to serverless, as you mentioned here. And they were in this transition process uh, right now, like modernizing their applications, which as a necessity, we all want to move faster, we want to have more flexible architectures, we want to build more inno innovative products, but at the same time, they realize that there's also a massive business risk behind following this approach. 
think about you in the role of a CAO and say, well, we're going to modernize our architecture, we're going to rebuild everything, replatform and so forth. The, you can, if you succeed, everybody would say you had to, yes, you did what you had to do. I mean, sorry. If you fail, you failed. It's, uh, so for them, it's a, it's a big risk to move down that route and we try to take that risk out of this process as much as possible. Really starting, obviously, with monitoring their traditional stacks as they have them today, but really supporting them along that entire journey to a cloud native architecture, starting with what we refer to as our support for monoliths to microservice architectures. So the idea is basically, you don't want to rip apart your application and figure out how it's going to work in a microservices world, but we have this technology that's called Smartscape. Smartscape more or less builds a real-time model of your entire data center and all applications running into it. And then you can more or less virtually dissect your monoliths, see, okay, well, how would they look like in a microservices architecture without touching any code and then making it work? So once you've done this, once you've decided to move there, uh, the next step obviously is you kind of rebuild that application. Usually we see applications with microservices architectures being significantly more complex or more distributed by design than a traditional app. You might have web server, application tier, database server. Now you might be talking about maybe 200 microservices or more. So like the 20 times range is uh, rather on, this, on, the, on the lower bound here which means that your traditional operational approach of, okay, it's either the database, the web server, the application server doesn't work anymore. On top of this, you did all of this to deploy fast, like go for like bi-weekly releases, even maybe daily or, or, or like a smaller granularity. So you're adding a lot of entropy to that system. Mm -hmm. And you have to analyze way more data than you ever had to do before. And this is where we're kind of getting to that, to that level where theoretically humans could do it, but it would just take us too long where the whole AI ops capability come in and where we say, let, let the machines, let a monitoring tool um, take care of it at that level. So we're helping them to operationalize these processes and then really supporting them along that whole journey where every customer who we talk to has like this vision, what we also heard today in the keynote of an autonomous cloud. Mm -hmm. And with Kubernetes, we already made a great step in this direction, looking at the infrastructure layer like today, say, I need five, uh, replicas of this container. I don't know how Kubernetes does it, or OpenShift and specifically here. It's going to happen, but if we move to the application layer, there's still a lot that has to be done, and it has to make it easier for people to do, and that's where we tie into um, the entire uh, customer's ecosystem to automate like their, their cloud environment and have actually built a practice around, which we call autonomous cloud management, that we have been working with, uh, with customers on to enable them to achieve this over time. Obviously, it's going to be a longer journey there. Yeah, so I mean, so what, you talked about that, yeah. you know, AC, autonomous cloud management. What exactly, you know, is that? And, and, and how are you bringing that to your customer base? Autonomous cloud management uh, resulted out of two different areas. The first one was when we were re-implementing our platform, what I mentioned before, mm -hmm. um, one step for us was to move to a SaaS platform. Mm -hmm. And we looked at all the operational practices that were around back then. We didn't know we don't want to build a knock. We, we really don't want to do it. Like having people 24 seven look at dashboards, then going to a wiki, then reading a description how to fix a problem. If you're an engineer, like, why, why do we do this this mm -hmm. way? It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So we developed our own practice, which we referred to as no ops. While no ops doesn't mean that you're not doing operations, that would be pretty crazy but not doing this traditional NOC mm. type of operation, sitting there staring at a screen 24 seven and then manually executing any operations. So we had our own practice that we built around it. And quite frankly, we just built it because we needed it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And then we kept talking to customers and partners, and say, hey, so it's really cool what you did there. Like, oh, how did you do this? What's like your software stack behind this? And what are the practices? What are your processes? What's the culture change? Mm -hmm. So we were engaging with some customers and then we were seeing that some of our um, customers back then even were doing bits and pieces uh, of this as well. And we found, okay, there's a lot of practice, a lot of knowledge around mm -hmm. how to do autonomous cloud management. And at the same time that we talk to like, the, the other customers who are not yet on a journey, who definitely want to get there, but are not quite sure how to do it and they don't want to figure it out themselves. Mm -hmm. So we thought, okay, let's take all of these best practices that we have and build more or less a methodology around it 
um, how to make this actually work, like how to do this. We really broke it down into like individual sprints. Do this in sprint one, mm. do this in sprint mm. two, to really have the results within three months, six months, 12 months, whatever the pace is that you want to run on. And then we realized, talking to customers, this by itself isn't still enough. So that's why we started to open up this to an entire ecosystem. Mm. So we brought ecosystem partners along, like working closely with Red and a lot of other companies, but also system integrators who can help us with bigger uh, projects because we as a company are a software company, so we're not a services or, or consulting mm -hmm. company. And we do support customers in some of those engagements, but if you think of like a really Fortune 500 company, that's a multi-year project that will keep hundreds of busy, uh, people busy. So to recap, we like built the methodology, we built the ecosystem to deliver on that promise at scale. And now the last step was we, um, as we were doing this, we also built like a reference architecture for it. And it was just an internal idea, so how do we like structure this, build that reference architecture, and then realized, okay, it's actually kind of like super helpful for customers, so that's, that's why we then decided to open source this reference architecture, this fabric as well, uh, to like the entire software community so they can also use it. So mm -hmm. technically it's really these three pieces. It's the methodology, it's the ecosystem, and it's like the reference architecture that you can work with to help you achieve that goal. Mm -hmm. All right, um, tell us how your AI fits into this. Uh, I've heard some analyst firms are saying, uh, you know, some of the next generation of uh, your, your space could be AI ops. Do you consider yourselves moving in that direction, or uh, do you have some counter view on that? I think today a lot of things are AI ops that might not be AI ops and it's still a very undefined goal. And as I mentioned earlier, we decided to have AI based algorithms as part of our platform five years ago. And nobody back then was talking about AI ops. Funny story, some of our competitors even told us you can't use AI for monitoring. That's like totally stupid. Then they bought other companies that they were doing it. But again, so the whole industry is learning here. I think it's really about data analysis. If you look at, if you scale the bigger and bigger environment, you really have to look at the process of what the human operations people are doing. And there's obviously some hard decisions that you have to take. There's, have, you have to work with teams to resolve hard problems. But the biggest portion is really data analysis and interpretation, right? And a lot of this can be put into an AI component that does it and what the Dynatrace AI does. It more or less is like your SRE in code, so to speak, which is able to find what's broken in the application, what was related to an issue in the application, and being able to automatically find the root cause. Very importantly, we are kind of like opinionated on how an AI for operational practices uh, should be working. Mm -hmm. Because one thing you don't want to do is you want, don't want to have an AI ops system tell you, well, you should restart this service because some neural network told you to do so. That's not building a lot of confidence. That's why our approach is really to follow like what we call a deterministic API, AI, sorry. Mm -hmm. An AI that is able to explain back to the user why it came to a certain conclusion. So why should I restart this service? Why should I roll back this deployment? Or why does the AI be believe that if I fix this problem, then like the bigger problem will be solved? So mm -hmm. that's our approach to, um, to AI ops we started. Uh, like roughly four years ago, five years ago, even a bit more than that when you, and I think I have a lot of experience really rolling it out at scale and seeing it really help people. Because the next, the ultimate next question we didn't always got was, if you already know what the problem is, why don't you fix it? And that's exactly the conversation you want to have. Maybe just to briefly add here, because it usually comes up, okay, you have AI, and uh, is it replacing people's jobs? Uh, I, I don't think so. Um, we also heard it in the keynote today from Chris. It's augmenting our capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, there's hard decisions that you have to take, but just going through tons and tons of data is not going to do this. And very mm -hmm. often when we talk to an operations team, or almost every time, first of all, you can't hire enough people anyways to get all, the, all done that's on your plate. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, just by the amount of data and the time, the time to react, it's just longer with a human in a standard scenario. Mm -hmm. We do this demo on, on self-healing of an application where we deploy something broken into production and have it being rolled back. And we can do it in 51 seconds. Hmm. No human can do it that fast. That's just what pure software automation can do for you. So I think that then you can focus on other 
areas that are more important, new projects. I always ask people in, in the op space, so what's, what are the three projects that you want to work on and you never have time to work on? Mm -hmm. And usually they come up with a list and say, yeah, this is what, we give you back that time to work on exactly those things that move your business forward. You said 51 seconds. You've never seen Stu in action. <laughs> You're, you, Stu, I have a lot of confidence in you. Well, we, we love the machine-enhanced human intelligence, as Chris <laughs> said, um, right. which, uh, you right. know, d d definitely we could all use uh, some, some machines to help us all right. uh, get away from the drudgery and be able to do more. Alois, yeah. uh, safe travels. Thanks for being with us. Thank Headed you. back to Austria. Let's say hi to all your folks back in Austria real quick. Hi there. Alois is on his way home, on his way to the airport, uh, but thank you for being with us here on theCUBE. Thanks for we having me. We appreciate the time. Our uh, coverage continues here, Red Hat Summit 2019. You're watching theCUBE.